Good afternoon, Pablo. How are you? Good afternoon. Very good. And you? <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. It's great to have the chance to talk to you again. We've, uh, we, as with many of my guests, we've had quite a few sort of online interactions, but we had managed to have a you know fascinating Zoom conversation in private recently Indeed. so it's great to have you on as a guest on sentientist conversations so i'm very happy to be here again likewise in public yeah thank you we'll see how consistent we are in the two conversations we're framing this series of conversations around the two most important philosophical questions or at least i think they are two most fundamental what's real how should we what should we believe about reality and what matters morally what should we care about and who uh, mm -hmm. and i'm framing this in the context of this very simplistic pluralistic worldview I'm trying to popularize called sentientism, which says we should take a naturalistic approach to thinking about what's real with humility. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to what matters, we should focus primarily on trying to assess sentience and grant moral consideration to any entity or any being that has the capacity mm -hmm. for uh, experiences, particularly valenced experiences. But in these conversations, as you know, I'm talking to people who agree or disagree with that philosophy. So it'll be fascinating to mm -hmm. understand your own journey and where you're at now on answering those two questions and their, what their implications are for the future. Uh, but before we get on to those, how would you best introduce yourself and the things you focus on? That's always a question I struggle with <laughs> because my work is very interdisciplinary. So I draw from many fields, ecofeminism, continental philosophy, critical race theory, animal rights theory, animal law. Uh, I've done a bit of work in conservation as well, uh, post-colonial theory. So uh, my work is very intersectional. So that's one of the things that perhaps why I struggle to explain what I do. But maybe yeah. what, when I'm more concrete, when I say what I do in my thesis, I think it helps more. So I just submitted my PhD thesis the 31st of August, and it's called the language. Of, thank you. It's called the language of zoo democracy contesting human sovereignty over animals. So basically, I try to understand on the first half how human language sort of constitutes us as subjects, humans, as our subjectivity, to hold a position of dominion over animals. What's the role of language in that respect? And then in the second half of the thesis, I, I explore whether there is a shared language between humans and animals, what I call animal language in the singular. So my, I argue that we speak the same language and we can communicate with each other, forge relationships and friendships in part because that language exists. And I try to theorize what is that language and what is the political bearing of that language. If it exists, should our political institutions change in some respect because of that? So that, that's a question I've, I'm considering in my thesis. And I've also done some work in the field of animal law. The work of Sudan and with Kimika have influenced me a lot here and other people like Manisha Dek and others. So yes, those are like a few of the things that I'm interested in, but yeah. Uh, Yes, that's more or less it. That's great. Thank you. And that's one of the things I love about doing these conversations is because I'm not a proper academic myself. So I just have the luxury of being able to dip into many, many different fields, the ones you talked about and some others as well. So it's great to be able to talk to mm -hmm. experts from such a dazzling variety of um, disciplines. And I think, you know, that's one of the themes that comes through your work is there's enormous value in taking those different perspectives and working out how they can complement each other. I think too often it's a bit of a trope. Academics can get stuck in a very narrow silo and there's value in going deep, but there's also real value in connecting across as well. Mm. So. so let's come on to the first of those two exactly. fundamental questions. What's real? And for many of my guests, that's a story about whether they grew up originally in maybe a more supernatural, spiritual, mm -hmm. mystical, religious society, context and family, or one that was already fairly naturalistic, maybe atheistic, agnostic, more scientific focused, had a, that type of worldview. Mm. Um, but then through their lives, how that, their perspective on the epistemological questions has shifted and where they are now. So yeah, you can wind the clock back as mm. far as you like, but it'd be great to understand that side mm. of your philosophical history. Yes, well, I, I was born in an atheist family. I was not baptized or anything like that. And it was very, if you like, scientific driven. There was nothing mystical in my life, really, yeah. until very late. When I was 23 or 22 that I came to London to study at UCL here, next to UCL, that's why I say here. And the University College London for people who might not be familiar with that university. And there I was introduced to the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, who some people might be familiar with, with his work. And the thing is, I was struck by this. Here, the question of language, of course, already came to the fore. It's the first time that I encountered this idea of language. But he he wrote this first book 
that was very influential at the beginning of the 20th century called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus or Logico, Logico Philosophicus in Latin it would be. And the last propositions, because it's a propositional, uh, that book is proposition one, a statement, proposition one, one, a statement, it, it goes like that. And the last ones, which he wrote in the First World War, uh, because he was the, uh, as a soldier and stuff, and he was writing uh, in that process, were really mystical. Like he was very influenced by Tolstoy's Gospel in Brief, um, The Brothers Karamazov, uh, and a novel by Dostoevsky influenced him a lot, and there is kind of mystical thought there. Mm. And I, wrote, I read his notebooks and stuff. And that where he it was very mystical, the notebooks. And I think I'm, I, am a, I would not define myself at all as a mystical person. I'm not into that kind of thing. But I, what that started me to show, or it made me sensitive to the dimension of reality that I thought had been hidden to me. Because I had, all I had seen was just, if you like, bare facts like science, like I had studied for my A-levels physics, uh, biology, that kind of stuff mathematics and it spoke, some of these things spoke to me a lot in relation to because Wittgenstein makes this distinction between saying and showing and he says there are things that we can say in a logic sense in a propositional sense but there are other things that we cannot and here comes things like poetry music the arts in general and feeling as well for that, that's in, in part why feminism has spoken to me a lot in my life mm -hmm. because it grounds you in your embodied existence in your experience uh, and all that stuff cannot be reduced, I do not think, maybe we disagree on this, to just scientific facts, to just neurology, just chemical reactions. I think there is more to it, and it's, but it's grounded in reality, it's not something mystical. But the point is that Wittgenstein helped me to, to open those doors, as it were, and then a lot of other uh, literature, little by little, influenced me in that regard. So I think I'm already touching in some of these things about what is real, and it's just already starts to come to the fore. But you might have some things to say about this or other questions, perhaps in yeah. this respect. No, that's fascinating. And is that where you feel you are now? So it's, I'd, I'd say it's still naturalistically grounded, but there's an appreciation that you can't capture everything that's meaningful in a sort of cold, clinical, mm. narrowly scientific worldview. So there is an openness to different you know, perspectives or ways of understanding. Is that, mm. is that fair? I think, yeah, it's in part related to morality. But to me, I, I think we said this before that in our previous conversation, I was telling you that to me, I something that is, has been clear for a while, and it's very counterintuitive to many philosophers, at least at the level of rationality when they think about this consciously, is this idea that value, ethical value, flows from reality. Yeah. Like that to me is very clear. And we see that even when we say sentience, but sentience matters because it is real. There are beings who actually suffer in yeah. reality. That's real. And so it is value lies there it does matter ethically, because this being is the kind of being who can experience suffering, who can force relationships, who can, who has a voice, for example, and has makes decisions, has preferences, all these things are grounded on who those beings are. And that is reality. So I say this because I would not label that naturalistic, the tradition of thinking I come from, the term naturalism or natural, what is naturalistic is not very present. But it is very grounded in reality. That's why I think when we were talking, we sort of met somewhere, even though we came from very different traditions of thinking. I think I mentioned this, but the work of the philosopher called Jacques Derrida. Yeah. Derrida is supposed in English, I'm saying it in French, especially one book called The Animal That Therefore I Am influenced me immensely mm -hmm. because he gives us this sort of, and it's very grounded in reality. So he says, literally, this is how the book begins. Uh, he says, oh, I enter into my bathroom. I'm going to take a shower. It's just all real, that's real. And then my cat came in and saw me naked. And then he says, and that experience, it shook him in a huge way because he felt ashamed first, but, he, but does the cat really see me naked? He starts to think about that. And then he starts to, little by little, he draws you or brings you to think, who is this cat in front of me? Can I know who she is? Because it's a female cat. We don't know the name, but we know she was female. And, and he says, we cannot truly grasp the full complexity of what this cat is seeing. We can't. And that there is something important then, not to reduce this other being, to see just a cat, one more cat or something like that. There is something very specific, singular about that being, as it were. And this is the notion that I was trying to mention. And this is, touches in part the second question, which we can get into that later. This notion of alterity of trying to respect other beings in their own terms as yeah. different beings who we cannot fully comprehend and say, this is who you are, full stop, right? 
we, we can't get later perhaps more into this, but to me, this sentence, a friend of mine from Queen's University, jo Joshua Jones, he sent this in a very nice way ways once. I, I really liked it. He said, look, we cannot, the, the sentence of he or she is just that. There is, that's so wrong to say that. If, I don't know, let's, you're talking with a pizza or you're talking with a waiter or you're talking with whoever, and they say, oh, I'm a pizza or I'm a waitress or whatever. And you say, oh, you're just a pizza. You're just a waitress. So that kind of thing tells us, no, that, that's not true. That person is much more than that. And that much more, a lot of those things we can know, but there is always something we cannot grasp. And I always feel that it's very important to be attentive to that. And it's very grounded on who we are and the nature of being, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and to me, all these is very intertwined, the real with the ethical. I cannot really separate them. And I think that's that's one thing I loved that you said last time, and you've repeated now, which is this idea that value flows from reality. I think where else could it flow from? Of course, it has to. It, it has to. So that's why I love it. But at the same time, <laughs> it's not obvious to many people. They think value seems to come from somewhere else, and that's where mm. I part company with them. And we'll, we'll come back onto that, obviously, when we start mm. talking about the, sure. the moral question, which you've hinted at there as well, because I think we do share that perspective that you know, mm. that moral grounding is based in an understanding of reality. But I, I wanted to pull you back to the the what's real question because I had I guess yeah. a couple of thoughts I, I share this view that there's a, there's often quite a cold hard narrowly scientific presentation of naturalism which seems quite mm -hmm. reductive it seems quite clinical it does seem to lose detail and nuance to simplify mm -hmm. to clarify to put things in a spreadsheet and I absolutely share your view that that is only a partial view of the world and that's partly why I tend to prefer using the term naturalism rather than science because I think science mm. is you know a collection of methods and approaches always fallible that are part of a naturalistic worldview and I think mm -hmm. of a naturalistic worldview as being uh, methodologically just the use of evidence and reason to develop and refine beliefs so it's very broad so evidence in that context doesn't just involve doing a, a double blind clinical trial or running some technical experiment or doing a survey, it can involve personal experiences, things that we're experiencing now, moment to moment. It doesn't have to be narrowly scientific. It can be very rich. Mm -hmm. And I think my sense of the natural world is also very rich in the sense that many of the things you talked about, aesthetics and poetry and beauty and individual perspectives, all of those things for me are part of the natural world. They're, they're breathtakingly complex, they're enormously rich, mm. they're fascinating, they you know, are, are deeply valuable, but they're not something separate from, for me from the real world. Ultimately, when you break them mm -hmm. down, I do think poetry would be, and my experience of poetry would ultimately be reducible to the architecture of my mind and the firing of neurons and waves of mm -hmm. chemicals and electrons firing. And that for me, that take, doesn't take anything away from their wonder and their beauty. It just means that I guess the way I think about naturalism is is very broad and and rich and is absolutely not just a sort of cold clinical scientific approach. But so I don't know if there's a resolution there between those two modes of thinking. But yeah, no, I'm very sympathetic to what you are saying. Here, I think it might be helpful to bring in some feminist thought, who, which has influenced me a lot as well in thinking mm. about these things. So something that is crucial in feminist and postcolonial theory as well and this kind of background I come from more critical theory, yeah. is the notion of context. So all these kind of fields insist we need to ground ourselves in our context to understand our reality, because our reality is historically situated. Just think about, for example, you are now are talking about science, right? The science, what we say is now science, that's not the enlightenment. So if we are talking about three, four centuries. Like we moved 1,000 years ago, and reality, in a way, it was so different. Of course, one could say reality was the same. We just perceived it differently. We had a different knowledge system. We were talking about epistemology mm. before. There was a different epistemology dominating how people were literally existing, how they were in the world, how they perceived it, how they lived it, and so on. But maybe it's more phenomenological things, what I'm talking about here, how we perceive things and how we uh, experience life as it were. So, you know, with Aristotle, when the branch of a plant moved, it was just because there was some sort of a spirit there moving it or whatever. It was not, gravity had nothing to do with it because we had not discovered gravity. But who knows where we will be if we are, if we exist, because we might just go extinct with climate change. But if we do exist in 500 years from now, maybe things that you and I assume that we think they are true, maybe they are not. So it's just very complex, this. And here, and this relates to my work, we talked about this as well in my previous chat, 
is this notion to try to think of what does language do in this? Because my thesis is a lot about that, mm. uh, especially for instance about, because this is what I'm always interested in. Why is it that many human beings on the, in the world do not really see animals? And what I mean by seeing here is not merely to say, oh, everyone looks at a pigeon and can identify this is a pigeon. It's not a chair. Of course, everyone can do that. But I don't mean that. What I mean by seeing is something more, much more profound than that, is to understand that being as a being who is a relational pigeon, who has friendships, who uh, feels all sorts of things. Mm, and, as a perspective. And to, and to me, our sort of what I call Western conceptuality, which is composed by or the human animal distinction, this kind of huge binary, the reason and reason, there are the ones that are, have reason, the ones who do not have reason. Uh, there are the civil ones, the notion of civility, and if you like barbarians uh, or whatever. Uh, and animals always fall on the spectrum of the animal, the ones who do not have reason, the ones who do not have language, and all that stuff that I'm saying, we are literally born into that. When we are born, we learn language that way, and it structures our thinking and our perceptions of the world. And that's really important when we are thinking a lot of the things we're saying about naturalism and whether we can reduce the world to just a scientific cold fact. And that's yeah. all there is to it. I don't think yeah. so, because all this is permeating our perception of reality. And yeah. here I wanted to say one more thing that I think it also challenges this scientific way of thinking. And I believe here we might not fully agree with this, but these notions, which again are very important in feminist thought of relationality and community. So something that is I believe relatively uh, there is a consensus, I think, in, in some of those fields, or so I think, is that a relationship cannot be reduced. This is what I would think, at least. What you, Jamie, experiences and what I, Pablo, experience as individuals, there is something about the bond in itself, about the relationship in itself, that matters and does exist somehow. It's, I don't know how to explain that because I would not reduce it. And here as well, by the way, I would talk of notions such as community, culture, and so on, which I know that you would just ground it because we were discussing this in our previous conversation, yeah. to, you know, artifacts in the world, the, the, the architecture of a certain place, the, the actual practices. And I would agree with that. I would include that as this is part of what culture is. But I would say there is something else happening there, if you like. Uh, and that's the notion of history as well, that I don't, and I don't say this, I want to make this very clear in a kind of, mystical weird sense yeah. i don't mean that yeah. but i do think there is something about talking about of a community as a community for example that cannot be reduced to just the aggregation of different individuals but i, I think the difficulty here is and maybe here i lack the, the discourse and the way to explain it i am still not able to explain these things in an articulate way what is that something uh, which is a, a very important question but this is i have to work on that i have yeah. i just finished my thesis and i was working on language but with time i hope i will explore some of these questions in more depth yeah. But I don't know. What do you think about this? Because and I remember I, you were not fully really convinced. Yeah, I think we do differ. I think we do differ, but there's still quite a lot of overlap because, oh, of um, course, yeah. On, on the one hand, there there is a sort of caricature of some of the traditions you come from, the critical traditions, and that caricature almost says that because you're so sensitive to context and perspective, that you've almost given up on naturalism and reality. Right? It's just disappeared completely because everything is context and everything is perspective. And I don't think that's a fair characterization of the tradition or most of the thinkers and certainly not your perspective. As you said, value flows from reality and reality exists. And I think some of the people who paint that caricature are themselves victim of some overcharacterization, which is that maybe a naturalistic worldview pretends we can have perfect understanding of reality. And there's an, a scientific overconfidence that we have in the facts and the evidence mm. and so on. So mm. I, I think there is, you know, more overlap than or more commonality than yeah, people recognise in that I think that a naturalistic approach needs to have humility at its heart. It needs to be probabilistic and provisional and always open to new evidence. Otherwise, it's not really naturalism. It's not really science, mm. right? Unless it's genuinely open minded. Yeah. Yes. And that humility that. needs to acknowledge different perspectives and different contexts. And even just in a technical sense, you and I have lived different lives. We have slightly different configured brains based on our genetics and our upbringing. And we have different inputs going into our eyes and our ears. And of course, we're going to perceive and think about things in different ways. And that's not saying, therefore, there is, therefore we don't share a reality together. It's saying we probably do, probabilistically. I'm pretty confident you exist, I exist, mm. and we live in some sort of shared reality. 
might be a simulation, who knows, but you know, we, we exist in a shared reality, but our perspectives are different and we will, mm. it's probably impossible to ever get to a perfect shared understanding of all reality. It's probably a journey we'll never finish. And it's probably also mm. technically impossible for me to ever perfectly understand your perspective or your view until we get to the per- point where we can run a, you know, Pablo emulator in VR or something, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's always imperfect. It's always imperfect. So I do hmm. I find value in both traditions because one seems to say when it's done appropriately with humility, always open to new evidence, we can try and understand this reality we all share. And the other perspective hmm. is always saying, yeah, we agree, but be very clear that the context and the perspectives can be radically different and you can't erase those in this pursuit to try and find a single over scientifically determined perfect answer of what reality is so I, I do think there's something in common between those two different schools of thought or toolboxes but I do think both of them are still trying to get a rich appreciation of reality you know I don't think there are many people who really want to totally mm-hmm. abandon reality and say nothing exists we can know nothing mm-hmm. sort of giving up approach but I also, yeah. that links to your perspective on relations and culture and maybe some of those other more intuitive factors. Because I, where, we do, where we agree is I think that you and I both see those as deeply and richly important as phenomena, mm. whatever they are. I think yeah. where we differ is that I do still see culture and relations and traditions and social norms ultimately as being something that is reducible to patterns of information processing in the minds of individual sentient beings and the fact Mm. that there is commonality between those patterns your sense of your relationship with me and my sense of my relationship with you is what makes it a relationship and that is important it's Mm. important it has impacts on me as a sentient being it has an importance on impact on you as a sentient being but i don't think in a technical sense anything you know, exists outside of us that is that relation. And I think a similar way about culture, I think enormously powerful, mm. enormously rich, because it's a shared, messy, overlapping pattern of common beliefs or values amongst a group of people. And I do think it's useful to talk about as a culture as well. It's a phenomenon, it's a level of abstraction, it's an important thing and a useful thing to talk about. Mm. But at a technical level, I do think ultimately it comes back down to, yeah, fizzing of neurons and chemical waves and patterns of information and and so on. So maybe we differ there because I think at its root, you yeah, yeah. you have this sense that without losing naturalism and without going to mysticism, there's something more than just a commonality of pattern between individuals. There's something above that. But I think exactly. we can both agree of their rich importance. But of course, yes. No, it's simply that, that when we talk of, if you like, um, the nature of a relationship or something like that. Uh, or in that, any kind of relationship, in any kind of interaction, but especially when there is a bond. I think there is something about the bond in itself. And we see this with animals, right? Say a cow and a calf. So I think that we see there a bond between the cow and the calf, that there is something about that bond in itself that I would think is intrinsically valuable, that we should not break the bond. So there is something normative there that is telling us you cannot break this bond, not only because and, but I would include that, of course, because the cow is going to be uh, affected if that bond is broken, she's going to suffer, uh, and she's not going to be able to develop as a mother. And the same with, with the calf, right? Uh, the calf will also suffer and experience this rupture. And they do. It's terrible. People who have witnessed that, I have not witnessed it, but yeah. I've read a lot about that. Yeah. But I would also add, there is something about the bond in itself. But, but then I, I also wanted to mention, uh, before we move on, or we touch other things about some of the things you said that first I should make clear because sometimes I can be very critical, but I do think science is amazing and super important and one of the main sources of knowledge we have. I do think that no doubt in medicine, in, we build bridges, we, I don't know, there are so many aspects of science that is just, we are having this conversation now on the laptop. Yeah. Right? I think that's yeah. incredible. So I think there are so many good things about science, but what, we, what my problem with this we cannot then just say you know science is wonderful in all respects and let's just celebrate it take it this is the truth the only truth there is there's nothing else to discuss i'm I'm questioning here and yeah so that's one thing but then something i really like when you were talking about being humble i excuse the technical term but the notion of epistemic humility so this to me is crucial so it's this idea of you need to always and i would invite people if they don't know this work 
uh, but I use a lot of work on this, but the work of cleansing in dangerous crossings to me is an exemplary of this kind of thing, because she's a post-colonial theorist and critical race theorist as well, and, and political scientist, she studied political science. And what she tries to tell us is in that book, look, when we need to understand a conflict or any situation, we always need to make a huge effort to understand the perspective of all the actors involved in the conflict and our own positionality. So if I am, say, doing a study, X, I, Pablo, need to try to understand where do I come from? Why do I think as I think? Uh, what is my background? What class do I come from? What is my gender? How have I been racialized? It's very important to talk as well in this sense that we are racialized in a, the verbal form, not mm -hmm. only this is race. No, this is a co historical construct that kind of shapes us in a fundamental way. And from that positionality, then I try to, I have to make an effort to try to understand what each actor is experiencing. And then from there, then we can make an ethical judgment, if you like. This is what she calls, Kim uh, calls this an ethic of mutual avowal. Uh, that's how, how she names it. But I think this is very important. And also here, I would also like to mention that because of the issue of uh, what context is, this kind of hyper relativist thing that you were saying, well, that's not truly what you are saying here by context. And I think I love this example that Lori Gruen, an eco-feminist writer, she, a philosopher, she's brilliant, gives in um, Animal Ladies, a chapter on that book called Not to Lobotomy. It's also her work, uh, Entangled Empathy is fantastic, and the notion of entanglement. Because what she's trying to say, and it's contextual, but it, it's so grounded in reality. She says, look, Today, in 2021, if now we go to the supermarket and we buy, I don't know, crisps, right? That we vegans might do, there is palm oil there. And she says, we are, when we do that, we are economically and materially entangled with people who are exploited, say in, I don't know, Thailand or wherever, somewhere in Asia, who have been exploited to produce that palm oil. And we need to think that we are materially entangled in that sense worldwide when we say, we purchase certain things and we should take that into account. And that's our context today. Mm. So it, it's a very, but that, 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 if you like that situatedness, that being so focused on the context and, and so on is not relative at all. It's telling us something normative in a very clear way, but it, yeah. it tells us by being very grounded on this is our context. This is not just something abstract. This is our reality now. And so these people are really making a huge effort to try to understand that properly. And it's very complicated because if you think about, say, the issue of whaling in the United States, right? So that is something that Kledzin Kim analyzes with the Macau community. Um, so she gets there and tries to understand, okay, what is going on in this Macau community? What are the different perspectives? And why do they have the, that, those perspectives? Why do the animal rights people insist on this point? Is there something racial going on? Why don't we focus on something that is perhaps major and more important and we are focusing on this case that everybody knows about? But a lot of other cases, the palm oil one, for instance, might not be as famous in some spaces, right? So she is, that, that's the thing that to me is super important to then pay attention to context for that region and the, all these different actors. Yeah. So I, I just thought that it might help a little bit to explain how context I'm understanding it maybe. Yeah, that's helpful. And I think that perspective helps us understand the you know successes and failures of science as well, because scientists yeah. are human beings with biases and values and incentives and drivers and personal context that can differ very and the only additional thing i was going to say before we move on to the second mm. or moral mm. question about this sort of what's real thing and you touched on it earlier on there is this sense that people think that science was something that was invented in europe in the last few hundred years since the enlightenment and of course that was you know a deeply important period and you know with many of its own problems that you, you can see coming to characterize much of you know western thinking about science today but again i like to think of naturalism in a much more broad sense there than mm. that because that was not the genesis of scientific thinking it was not the genesis of naturalistic thinking and as i've been working on this sentientism idea i've been tracing back in an amateurish way some of the roots of both a sentiocentric way of thinking um, you might think of the concept of a hint so that is richly runs through jainism and buddhism and many other cultures but this idea about caring about non-humans is not a modern <laughs> idea right it's not something that vegans came up with in the 1940s in oxford but on the naturalistic side that again has deep and ancient roots in many and most cultures. And mm -hmm. it's sort of obvious why, because having a decent appreciation for the nature of reality is pretty useful if you want to survive. <laughs> so this idea that these things are modern inventions, I think is way too narrow. And arguably on the naturalistic side, you can even, this might be pushing 
the concept a bit too far, right? But in a sense, even before humans were around, uh, non-human animals operate in a fairly naturalistic way, right? They're exploring their environment, they're using their senses, they're trying with epistemic honesty and humility to try and model the world because they need to survive. So I think, you know, if you really want to push it, naturalism even predates humans. This is not a modern invention if you really think broadly enough. I really think that the way you think of naturalism, to me, it reminds me a lot to the understanding of philosophy ancient Greeks had. Then knowledge was not divided like now in categories that you have biology, mathematics, astronomy, physics, whatever thing, and philosophy, and then language. No, you had Aristotle writing all sorts of books about biology with the animals, dissecting them and whatever thing. And you also had him writing politics, law, all sorts of things. They all were very well versed in sort of astronomy or something. So the point is knowledge was not conceived as this compartment, hyper compartmentalized thing. Yeah. It was what I do now in a way that I draw from everywhere and I read and I do what we could call now interdisciplinary work. In those days, it was, that's what you did. Yeah. That's what you did in yeah. philosophy. So that's what to me it sounds when you talk of naturalism, sounds a little bit to me. But that was not exclusive to the ancient Greeks, as you said. That if you look at the Mayan cult site, you look at the yeah. Arabic world, that's what it was incredible. I just say that one because I'm more familiar with it, but there are a lot of other uh, spaces where that was happening. Yeah, I just wanted to mention. Yeah, one of, my, one of my favorite examples, and I think I mentioned it to you before, was a blind Arab poet called Al Mari, who lived, I think, in about the year mm -hmm. 1000. So I've put him on our sentientism.info page of suspected celebrity sentientists, even though he predated the term by about a thousand years. But he wrote, even then, in a very different culture about taking an explicitly naturalistic approach. You know, he challenged many religious and supernatural ideas, and he talked about using evidence. Uh, but actually, to bring us on to the you know, second part of our conversation about morality, he was essentially talking very directly about non-human animal suffering and the immorality of animal farming and essentially prescribing what we in a modern world call veganism and this was a thousand years ago in in arabia yeah there's fascinating examples the more you look the more you find these deep roots yeah but let's move on to that second question now of, of what matters morally because there's another caricature of some of the thinkers and some of the traditions you come from so the first one we've said that these people have given up on understanding reality at all it's so driven by perspectives there's no grounding for reality so they've given up on knowledge right <laughs> which again i think is an unfair characterization and we've helped put that to bed in the first part of our conversation but there's mm -hmm. another caricature which i think is unfair which is that if you take this sort of more postmodernist approach or a relational approach you're also ending up as a moral relativist you're almost saying look anything goes right everyone has their own perspective they're all as valid as every other there's no good there's no bad it's just different perspectives competing in a marketplace of language so again from our previous conversation i know that isn't a fair caricature of the way you think certainly and i don't think it's a fair characterization of that field of study and thinking either but neither you or i have a sort of supernatural world view where there's a deity and there's a list of rules or there's a book that you have to do these things otherwise you'll go to heaven or hell so it is an interesting question to ask then okay so what do we ground our morality on so in this part of the conversation i guess there's two sub questions one is you know given you in this very broad sense have a sort of naturalistic uh, view of the world how would you ground morality you've, you've mentioned that value flows from morality but how, do, how does that work for you and then the second part of the question is really about moral scope or moral considerability because i'm very interested in people's journeys as how they've gone from again how they grew up thinking about which entities matter family other humans and how they've gone on a journey over time and where they are now how they set that scope of moral considerability today so um, again another crazily broad question but very interested in yeah, how you think about those two deep moral questions you've said so much there that we could just sorry talk for one hour on those sorry things, but i just want to first mention a few things of what you said just to because of the issue of positionality that for me is very important i want to make a few things clear before yeah. i continue so the first thing is that I, I just want, I, I know you didn't mean that at all, eh? but I don't speak for the fields or anything no. like that. It's just my reading of those fields and how I see it. I just want to make clear that when I say, <laughs> oh, I've done feminism or feminists think like these things or the others, it's just my reading and in a way my, it does come from, I'm influenced by those fields, but there might be people who come from those fields that might listen to me if they do, and they might think, well, I don't feel represented by this view or whatever, or this is a misreading of this author. So that, I know that you didn't mean that, but I wanted to make that. Thank you. No, that's an important point. Also, to, that's an important point to make because we have that problem all over the place where people 
are yeah. arbitrarily and incorrectly anointing someone as a representative of some field or group. Exactly. And, yeah. I'm mean, just, I just, I'm not, I, I submitted my PhD, so no one will think that I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I, I still wanted to make that clear. And then with the use of postmodernism, because I've never felt identified with postmodernist thinking in some respects. And also mm -hmm. with relational approaches, if you like more, but I, it's just because I come, the work of a philosopher called Martin Heidegger influenced me a lot. And he talks of this Greek idea of Alicia in Greek, I'm pronouncing it. I never know how English people pronounce it, but it is most people would tra tra traduce that, translate that as truth. And Heidegger uh, talks of it as disclosure, which in part is touching with a lot of these things we are talking. And the idea of disclosure is that by being grounding in a historically situated reality and all that stuff I've been discussing before, mm. then one tries to disclose, if you like, the nature of reality, ethics, politics, whatever one might want. And that is something that then, when one is in that kind of way of thinking, one doesn't really talk of approaches. Like it's not, in my field, you don't say, I'm using this approach, I'm using that approach. Some people will, will do it and think in those terms that they are situated in a certain approach or a certain camp. And certainly I do situate my work within ecofeminist literature and so on, but I don't say I'm using a relational approach. I don't say that anywhere. So for, yeah. for that's something that I think it might be interesting to bear in mind. And something that I do want to say here about what matters morally. Yeah. So this is why, because we are in a sentient, sentientist conversation, I, 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 I do think that sentience matters. Yeah. Um, but as we discussed in the past, to me, what is, I'm a pluralist, if you like, I don't like to label myself, but I will do it now for the sake of the conversation. If I was to be labeled as something, I would be a pluralist, pluralist, ethically speaking, an ethical pluralist, as it were. Yeah. And what that would mean is, if we take into account this idea that, you know, value flows from reality, then there are multiple dimensions from which value flows from. One of them is, say, if you like, sentience, this capacity to experience joy and to suffer. But also, to me, a relationship, there is something, as I said before, about in the bond that matters. There is something about how different communities of animals organize the, themselves socially. There are different modes of social organization. Horses live in, in, in harems, so they organize in one way. And a shoal of feces, depending on what the fish, I say feces in the plural, because they are not just the fish. Like we say mammals, we say cats, we say dogs, but we say the fish. fish. Yeah. I just think I, I find that crazy. Like Jonathan Balcombe uh, mentioned this in you know, one of his books. But anyways, so there are different modes of social organization that I would say there is something valuable there. There is also something valuable, as I was saying before, about difference. And this is something that is really present in the LGBTQ community. It's really present in, say, Aboriginal peoples, even the UN in the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It says in the preamble, that all indigenous communities and all peoples in the world as to where they should have the right to live and to develop their own forms of existence, communities, cultures in their own terms. So it's this idea that you respect different mm, ways of living and not only respecting them, I, I want to make this clear, but also to cherish them, to value them. That there is something so beautiful and good in just, you know, and here as well comes the idea as well with gender or different understandings of if you like womanhood right so mm -hmm. different people might feel that they are women or men in different ways and there is some also and this is recognized in many constitutions and freedom of speech that's the the, the principle there is difference we value that different voices can speak in their own terms we think that's important that matters and we we recognize that in constitution, sometimes in the first articles of the constitutions in some cases, or in the first amendments or whatever thing. So I, I just, and the, the idea of religious freedom as well, again, difference, boom, you have it, the crucial thing. So yeah. we are seeing here at least a few, there are more, and I just not going to try to list all of them, yeah, but yeah. there, and I, we would never finish, uh, probably there is no end to that. But the point is then to say, ethics is about sentience. Ethics, or in you know, in Pita Singha's case, I think here, and to me, it's reductive as well. Everything can be reduced to the utilitarian calculus to just take all experiences which are unique, specific, situated between a specific beings like you and I, who are unique beings, and you translate that, you turn that into abstract unities that are homogeneous, mm. just joy and uh, uh, suffering. That's all there is to it. But they are then you are erasing that specificity, that uniqueness. And that, in my view, cannot be reduced to a calculus. There is something irreducible. I know that this is circular, but I do think so. Uh, and I've written on this, but this, again, would be quite long to explain. But I do think there is something very important there. So when you tell me what matters morally, so all these things, right? Relationality, 
uh, so forms of social organization, difference, sentience, individuality as well. So if we think that different beings, uh, they make decisions, they have voices. So we need to respect that. We need to value that this dog doesn't want to live in a house. This dog wants to be a stray dog because she likes to just roam around freely. So why should we say, no, you live in this house because we say so. Who are we to say that? Yeah. So to me, what matters, like we would never say that about him. We do say that about human beings because when a certain human deviates a lot from this paradigmatic human person who many Sadeka and many, many Sadeka and many others have defined as this able-bodied man who is rational, independent, white, civil, that kind of paradigmatic ideal uh, that comes from the enlightenment, by the way. Um, then we say, okay, those who deviate from that ideal, for example, people with severe cognitive disabilities, or people just with some psychiatric illnesses, we just put them in hospitals and they are locked there because those who are follow that normative kind of framework say so. But then, uh, of course, there will be cases that there might be difficulties in some cases, just as a matter of say security or whatever things. But in many other cases, it's like, this makes no sense. Like it makes no sense. And with animals, it certainly makes no sense. Who are we to just say that a horse can be trained and then just obey human orders and break the horses? Like we talk in those terms, we need to break the horse. But if we need to break the horse, it's because that horse has an individuality, a personality, a voice. There is something there that is a who, not just a what. And that requires to value that being in her or his own terms. Yeah. And we, we take all these things seriously. Then to reduce all that to sentience, which sometimes happens, and sometimes it's not reduced, but it's overlooked what I'm saying. Yeah, I've heard yeah. so many times, and I have heard this many times, all there is to ask is, are they sentient when it comes to drawing the line? And my response to that has always been internally. No, that's not all there is to ask. There is much more to ask, much more to value, much more to consider. And that does not mean at all that sentience is not important. Sentience yeah, is yeah. super important. Like, I would never dare to say that we should not care about another being suffering. Of course, we should care a lot about that. But we should also care about all these other things. And why should we choose? They sometimes, they're, oh, we need to choose relational approach, sentientist approach, whatever. That's why I don't like approaches. I don't yeah, start yeah. talking in terms of approaches. I just try to think what matters ethically? Where do I think there is value? That's how I try to think of things. And then, from there and then considering context all the things we've been discussing when tries to make an ethical judgment that it will always be um limited because all of us are limited and that's why it's important to listen to different voices to try to reach consensus with different people that's why democracies matter for example that's just how i think of these things a little bit i believe the first question at least and also more the scope a little bit i'm starting to touch on it yeah but uh, you, yeah, you might have to no that's about. fascinating i'm very strongly drawn to the pluralistic approach partly because of in the same ways i think it's useful for us to have epistemic uncertainty about what's real because we can't perceive or understand things perfectly it's useful for us to have moral uncertainty as well we are just you know evolved apes wandering the savannah right who how arrogant to think we would immediately be able to jump to the right answer it makes sense to at least consider a pl plurality of approaches and to try and work things out now there's i guess there's a couple of risks in that one is that we have a pluralistic approach just as a way of justifying our intuitions instead of challenging them. So there's, I guess there's a risk there that it becomes a bit self-serving. We just use a plurality mm -hmm. of approaches just to come up with a conclusion we feel like we want to get to in the first place. And I guess there can also be a approach that can draw you a little bit more to a relativistic approach, because if you go super pluralistic and you're not ready to make value judgments, there is a danger there. But overall, mm -hmm. I think the pluralistic approach feels, feels very important to me. And I, you touched on two aspects. One is a plurality of different ethical systems. And again, I'm an amateur here, but many people, when they hear the term sentience and they think of sentientism, they will think of Peter Singer and the utilitarians and Jeremy Bentham. But I've been trying to broaden out this definition of sentientism to say it's not explicitly utilitarian. All it says is we should have moral consideration for all beings that are sentient. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you can then apply whatever ethical system you like. So you can have a system of virtue ethics that looks at being kind to sentient beings you could have a, 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 a care ethic that is talking about expressing care for all sentient beings you could have a rights approach that grants rights to all sentient beings or a deontological approach so so in a, in a sense i'm suggesting we should have a very pluralistic approach to different ethical systems of how you trade off different interests or how you think about ethical problems 
but let's at least as a backstop make sure we grant moral consideration to all sentient beings at least as a safety mechanism mm -hmm. if you like but then the second area of pluralism you talked about again i think we differ but there's still overlap because mm -hmm. i would absolutely agree that culture and relations and difference and as well as sentience all are enormous sources of value but where i think you maybe see them as potentially in independent if linked sources of value for me they seem to inexorably flow back through sentient so a mm -hmm. relation is important between you and me because of its impact on you and me as sentient mm -hmm. beings whereas a relation between my phone and this mug is not morally interesting because neither of them are sentient so that yeah. relation is only important in the way it affects me as a sentient being and the same with mm -hmm culture i think there's enormous value in culture but i think that value is reflected through how it impacts positively or negatively on sentient beings so i think we both mm. agree there's value there it's just whether that value is i guess intrinsic and somewhat independent or whether for me it flows back through sentience but i do also like the the way you emphasize difference and looking at things on their own terms because personally that's one of the things i find frustrating with some versions of a sort of more clinical calculating utilitarianism is this idea that you can replace and offset independent units of experience and and that's something that intuitively doesn't seem to sit well with me because my suffering certainly wouldn't be offset by your pleasure i would still be mm -hmm. <laughs> suffering and that's still a bad thing so so i do have this sense that again sentientism is not about do you quantify sentient experiences it's about granting moral consideration to all sentient beings and you could do that because they are repositories of sentient experiences or you could do that because they are ends in themselves but regardless the evaluation of those sentient experiences you know who is best to do that but the individual themselves so i i completely agree that we need to think about mm. experiences on the terms of the individual whether they're mm. a victim whether they're oppressed whoever they are right it's their perspective that matters not our assessment from the outside of their perspective so again i think there mm. are differences about how we'd approach that plurality but there's there's mm. still you know, some commonality in that oh. mm. different Indeed. perspectives no, as well. I, I just want to say about what you were saying now, lots of things, but the, the, especially about the end that you said that one suffering does not offset the, the other or, or something along those lines in, in reference to Singh. And this is something I've always felt really strong about with, with, with his with the work of Peter Singh and utilitarianism more generally, but specifically Singh also. So, there is this notion that you always have to aggregate the pleasant, the pain, and then with the aggregation, whatever result you get, then you make, that's it. You don't really make a decision really, because with Singer, you know, the only decision you make is to follow the utilitarian calculus. That's all you decide. But that to me makes no sense for the following reason. There are some actions that are intrinsically wrong. They are wrongful actions that generate pleasure. For example, a very famous case in Spain is bullfighting causes pleasure to many people. Like some of the bullfighting is broadcasted in Spain, for instance. Yeah. And the bull is suffering a lot, but many humans are really enjoying that experience. To me, we should not consider at all the pleasure those humans are experiencing. That should be outside the, our kind of ethical concerns or what we consider ethically, because the action is wrong. It is intrinsically wrong. And so we should not take it. And then you raised at the beginning two points. One that it could be just justify intuitions, or it, we could just be led to follow our intuitions. And then that we can end up when we take a pluralistic approach in a sort of relativistic position. So where do we draw the line? How do we deal with it? So with the issue of intuitions is that I do not think that any of the things I've said are just intuitions. So there is a huge body of literature that I would invite people to read in ecofeminist thought that comes, by the way, from the 80s, starting with Marty Kiel, uh, one that responds to this circular affair that was an article by a conservation ethicist called Bart Calicott. And then in the 90s, they wrote a lot, ecofeminist, like there was a kind of explosion of literature there. Yeah. Carol J. Adams was super important, Lloyd yeah. Gruen, Josephine Donovan, a lot of people. And they really theorized very carefully what these relationships are about, what these communities are about, why do they matter? Why we should not think only in terms of interests, for instance. Deborah Slicer has a wonderful text. I think it's, I don't remember now the name, 
but it's a very nice text where she's criticizing the interest approach because she says it reduces, this is a, I'm paraphrasing perhaps even quoting, that uh, the problem with interest theories is that it reduces beings and actual experiences to a bundle of, atom, a, an atomistic bundle of interests, an atomistic bundle of interests. That's mm. right. So that's the quote. And that, and she argues this like properly, and they tell you why we should take into account experiences like this, what we are saying, for example, taking into account different voices. Uh, and Josephine Danova and, and Carol Adams wrote in 2007 that we should listen to what animals tells us, not to what other humans are telling us about them. That's it from 2007. So the thing is, and they discuss these things at length in those works. So I would just say that if one reads that, I'm not going, I kind of go case by case, <laughs> it would take ages, yeah. but it's not just intuition, like it's really grounded on something proper arguments. There are whole books on this. Yeah. And then the issue of, the, the issue of drawing the line that I, I, this is much more complex uh, issue here and very difficult to answer. We are getting, you've got now to the difficult, for me, it's the most difficult question, the one of drawing the line. So something that Deborah Slicer says in that article, and Matthew Calarco has discussed this as well, another philosopher that I really like in his book, Thinking Through Animals by Matthew Calarco. But also Deborah Slicer talks, and it's not only her term, but I, I take it from her that people have talked about this notion of moral remainders, which I think is really important. So there is often, and this is certainly case with Singa, but it's present in other uh, positions in the animal rights camp, perhaps Francione in some ways as well, and other people, is this notion of being self-assured, being content with what we do. So in a way, when one follows the utilitarian calculus, that's the right thing to do. Full stop, we are fine, no problem. What the notion of moral remainders tries to, attempts to capture is that regardless of all the decisions we make, how carefully we consider everything, whatever we might do, we might still need to be, or we might still be haunted by some decisions. We might still not feel fully comfortable with, with what we have done because mm -hmm. we are limited because we are still do wrongful actions. For example, when, while you and I think you are as well, but I'm vegan, okay? Yeah. And you are vegan also. So, right. Now we could say we are fine because we are vegan. We're not fine. There are lots of things that our current agricultural system of agriculture is doing. There are mice who are being systematically killed. We use herbicides and all sorts of a lot of uh, chemical products that are harming the environment massively with the products that we, you and I eat as vegans. And I eat some of those product, products yeah. as well. I go to restaurants and things and I know I'm participating in that. So I, I want to say that because it, I think it's, it, it begins to answer the relativistic approach issue, but also the non-relativistic approach, if you like. So whoever thinks I've got it right, yeah. I should feel that it, this is all good. My response would be really like, let's look at this carefully <laughs> because I don't think it's the case. So that's one thing I would like to say before we talk about how to draw a line. Then the issue of drawing the line is that once one takes that into account, another thing that I stress in my work and I'm very influenced here, even though I'm very critical with the work of Donna Haraway, but Donna Haraway has influenced me immensely on this in When Species Meet. She says that something along the lines that our existence is intrinsically violent, human existence. There is no way to live without killing. Even if one considers, I, we were talking about this uh, in our previous conversation, the idea that when we are consuming a certain part of Earth, simply because we need to produce foods, for example. Some animals cannot use those environments. We might, uh, while we are um, doing that, we might kill, uh, I don't know, snails while we walk on the pavement. We might kill ants when we walk on it. We might like road kills with animals. That happens all the time. So the point is that um, one, in a way, what one should do in a way is to say, okay, we need to accept that our existence is violent and then try to reduce that violence as much as possible in most scenarios, there are cases of self-defense and some cases that we might say it was legitimate or it was justified to be violent in this occasion. Yeah. But in most cases, I would say we should just try to reduce violence as much as possible, but accept that our existence is violent. From that, now, after I've said all these things, what it comes down to is that we might think, for instance, that even plants, some of the things I've said, even plants, one could argue, it might be sentient. Some of research is coming up that says that some plants might be sentient. We might consider, I don't know, I have not studied this matter, so I'm just here, it's more hypothetical, but I, it's something I will try to explore in the next years because I only animals, there is so much to think of. Yeah. But 
but let's consider the question of plants here because I think it, it, it is important that they are, let's say that they are relational, that they have some sense of community. I'm not sure what I'm saying is true, but let's assume some of these things are that they are sentient in some cases. So then I think what I would then say is, in a way, I would then try to think, okay, when we think about value flowing from reality, to what extent here we see, if you like, I don't like the idea of aggregating or summing up, but we might notice, and this is also a bit, in a way, unavoidably anthropocentric in some respect, right? We humans are attentive to certain dimensions of reality that other beings might be attentive to other dimensions of reality that we are not. Uh, for, say, uh, if the idea of, you know, what is it like to be a bat? So the bats will be probably, what is this kind of sonar system? What does that mean to exist like that? Something like along those lines. So to some extent, I would say the dimensions of reality that we are attentive to ethical matters as well, and direct us to think, at least with my limited knowledge, but I, I acknowledge here that I have not done the work of seriously taking into account the question of plants. But let's assume for the sake of the argument that then we find out that if you like more value flows from say cows and pigs and whatever than certain plants, then we might say, if I have to make a choice between a cow and a plant, was I would because we have to choose. There is no way around it. We need to choose what do we eat because the question is not whether we eat or not. It's how to eat the best way possible. Mm. Uh, what Derrida called the question of eating. Then I would choose the cow uh, because I see there is more value there for all these reasons we were discussing before. But I what I would not say, and I want to make this very clear, is it is fine to kill plants and we should all feel happy about it or indifferent. I would not say that. I would say when we destroy for it, and that there might be something intrinsically valuable about those things when we cut them, for instance, and we should try to cut, for example, I would not be in a fireplace with actual wood. I think we should not do that. I don't know, a, a branch falls or a tree dies or whatever. We might then consider that. But otherwise, I don't think we should go around cutting trees, not only because it's the homes of many animals, which we should also take into account. It is their home, the forest, by the way, and they need the trees to live. It's their homes. We don't go around the homes of humans destroying them Similarly, we should not destroy uh, their homes, who, which might be trees, in, in this case, say, squirrels or birds or whatever. But also, because there might be things that, have, and I have not studied this, but there might be things, there might be value in the existence of those beings. And if there is, and we need to kill those beings to survive in some cases, which we should try to minimize as much as possible, then we should, here comes the notion of moral remainders. We should just feel troubled by that. And as Donna Haraway says, we should stay with the trouble and not just feel indifferent about it. And yeah. to need to lead a good ethical life does entail living that, experiencing that troubleness and feeling uncomfortable with these decisions and living like that. Yeah. Uh, instead of, oh, the calculus that, says that, this is that, the right thing to do that, and that's it. That's part of the motivation to try and do better. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I think the, Again, one of the odd things about sentientism is it doesn't tell you which things are sentient. It just says you should take a naturalistic approach to working it out with humility. I remain open-minded about plant sentience. I actually haven't seen any claims that they're sentient. I've seen mm. some great stuff about their communication ability. I think they do have relations. They have more complex behavior than we've seen. But I haven't seen anyone actually yet seriously claim that they actually have a subjective experience. And I think you're right to be to properly act with humility, both epistemically, we need to be ready for new evidence, and then we, mm. we need to be ready to shift our moral behavior as well as we learn more. Yeah, I completely agree with that sort of humility and that, as you said, ability to stay in the trouble and use that as a motivation to try and do better or do less bad at least. But one of the things I wanted to mm. come back to is, I guess, one risk with having diff additional sources of value like culture, mm -hmm. as an example, is that when you mention bullfighting, you're right, there's two, there's at least a couple of ways people might justify bullfighting. One might be a sort of naive utilitarian approach, which says 8 million people got an hour of pleasure, and that's more than the suffering of the bull. Therefore, mm -hmm. when I put that into my spreadsheet, it was a net positive utility outcome. So bullfighting is good, right? That's one, <laughs> one approach. But there's another, which actually maybe uses some of your mode of thinking which says yes the bull is a sentient being yes it suffered but there is an independent source of value that you're ignoring here which is culture and in certain parts of spanish and french culture bullfighting is 
has a rich, deep, mm -hmm. powerful cultural resonance that is actually reflected in the relations between millions of people. And that value is so powerful and so rich, the cultural mm -hmm. value, the relational value, that it swamps the victim's experience completely. So in a weird way, how do you resist that challenge where people say, I agree with you, Pablo, that culture is in a sense an independent source of value. So if my culture values oppressing and harming, you know, other sentient beings, people in the out group, or even people within our own community, if our culture says it's good and culture has value, why can't we act with impunity? And there, there is, you, you feel that theme running through some public discourse where there's a sense that mm. particularly if a particular cultural group has themselves been oppressed, then their culture can become a bit of a shield for things that culture then does to other groups or oppressed minorities within their own group, human or non-human. So mm. that's one of my hesitations about seeing culture as a completely independent source of value is can it mm -hmm. then justify harming sentience? Again, yeah. No, yeah, it's a very, very valid challenge? question. It's a very good question. But here, my response would be, again, Clayton King's ethic of mutual power. So what one should then do is to try to say, OK, let's put on the table here everything that might matter and matter. So the culture here is important, but we also need to look at this critically. So is a certain practice that a culture endorses as a cultural value, as something that is important for that culture, is that good? Because there, we can be critical about certain yeah. cults, I believe. Certainly, I can be critical of the Spanish culture. I come from there. So I can say, I think that this aspect of our culture is really problematic. What Clayton Kim says, but it's tricky, is what the moves he makes, but she says it is a provisional thing. I'm not going to get that in, into why she says it's provisional, but I want to explain something about her ethics of Mozilla Powell. She says, we need to take, as it were, put on the table all the actors, all the perspective, and try to ponder them equally, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I wouldn't endorse that fully, but I think it's an ex it's interesting exercise not to fall into, say, for example, imperialist thinking. I think it's important. Yeah. So yeah. she would say, let's take very seriously the perspectives of the bull here, the bulls in mm -hmm. that bullfighting ring. Let's take very seriously the perspective of people participating in it because it's a cultural thing that people value a lot. Let's take seriously the people in Spain who think it is wrong, because many people in Spain think it is wrong, but they, it's never been put into a vote, for instance, and change the constitution. No one has, I have never been asked, do you want this in the constitution or not? I've not been asked that. And the Spanish parliament passed it and introduced it in the constitution as a cultural uh, protecting culture. So anyways, there is all that. And then one would take into account all these perspectives and then make a judgment on it. So does the interest of the bulls in not being harmed override this cultural value? And in, but also not only this cultural value, but look specifically about what the people within that culture are telling you, because you might be surprised with the result. You might have that most Spanish people think that should not happen at all. Yeah. And therefore, or maybe not everybody, but maybe 40%. And if then you take into account all these things. But yeah. even then, even if everyone in Spain thought this is what we should do, I still think it, we should not do that. Because, and here I, I want to introduce another, another term that to me is very important, the notion of zoo democracy, which is also central, as I said at the beginning in my PhD thesis, is the, the main title, as it were, there's a subtitle, but the main title is the language of zoo democracy. If we understand that we need to build a society in which we think of other animals as having a voice, as being beings who are agents, who make decisions, and that their voice should shape our political and legal systems, and that we should think of the people of a country, not only in terms of human people, but human and non-human peoples, yeah. then we don't kill the peoples of a country in a bullfighting ring. We don't do that in a democracy. And if we transform our understanding of democracy from a democracy or a human democracy, demos is human people, to a zoo democracy, zoo means animal, a lot of cultural things would need to change and our political and legal systems. So yes, my challenge to the person who would say the cultural value is of this practice is super important and whatever thing, in the Spanish case I'm talking about, I would say the bull's interests override that by hugely. I agree with you that cultures should be criticised, right? That culture shouldn't be a shield or a defence or some sort of magical boundary to say anything within this cannot be challenged, right? We, cultures can be criticised mm -hmm. and, and evaluated, if you like. And my question was going to be, okay, but then how do we assess a culture? How mm -hmm. do we 
challenge it on what basis now now for me i would assess a culture based on the good or the bad things it does to the experiences of the sentient beings impacted human and non-human so you'd look at you know, any potential victim inside that group or outside you'd think about things in their terms about how they're impacted how they're hurt or how they're benefited and you wouldn't necessarily add the, that up simply but that's the raw material you'd use to think about is this particular cultural practice a good one or a bad one and and you answered it in a slightly different way which but it did come back to considering individual perspectives and individual sets of values and not treating the culture as a sort of homogenous block where the experiences of victims or the oppressed within that culture are erased or wiped out because we're just looking at the culture. I think either way, you have to look at a more granular level to understand in their own terms, the experiences of victims and the oppressed mm. and the participants who are benefiting or are being harmed by a cultural process. Because there are so many different mm. modes in which culture is used to as a defense, right? You can see what's going on in, for example, the Catholic church at the moment where people were using a defense of the institution mm. to justify covering up child abuse or you can see it in various other communities which have been subject to awful oppression themselves but then oppress women or gay people within their own community and sometimes use their own culture as a shield for that criticism but you can see it in even very modern contexts mm. as well because you and i as strident vegans will challenge the animal agriculture movement and part of the pushback to us will be look yep. this brazilian ranching culture is deeply important to the way we live our lives culture has mm. value and yeah i'm going to ignore all of the but millions it, of sentient but, beings but, that harmed in that sense but even we don't need to get into that kind of context fish and chips in the uk yeah. so the, yeah. the thing is it's part of the culture yeah it's part of the culture, but the, the, the point here is not to then say, oh, it is culture, we cannot say anything about it, as yeah. they said. We just, but I think it's very important, this notion of rural democracy. I don't think people have a still got in animal rights theory how important it is. Because if you really take seriously the idea, these beings have voices that need to be respected, and we need to build a political system. That's listen to them. The yeah. coordinates of thinking, the coordinates of what matters ethically, how we make decisions, change automatically because you are not the human people deciding you are the human and non-human people deciding and then we need to try to understand we still don't know this we are we would need to explore and we need a lot of thinking here with animals and we need to listen to them is how the hell do we represent animals politically that's yeah. a very different difficult question and how do they self-represent themselves not only humans talking on behalf of, but how do their voices really shape political institutions? That's a very difficult question that Sutan Arshan and Will Kimblika have offered the most comprehensive kind of theory of animal rights, thinking about these questions called the Zoopolis, the book. But there is a lot of thinking to do and a lot of things to, to work on there. But I it's, really- It's a fundamental I think this shift. Super yeah. important. Yes, exactly. It just, and the, but I did want to say one thing before we finish. One thing that I wanted to say well, I will not say it. It's just the issue of sentience as baseline, because I, I just feel that all these things about relationality, difference, and so on, I don't think that sentience is underlying everything. There is the baseline or the necessary condition. To me, they are all in, in parallel, as it were. I see sentience, I see difference, I see relationality, and so yeah. on. I just wanted to mention that we could discuss that. And I think that is one difference between us, because as you said, you see them as in parallel, if you like. I see them all as valuable as well. Mm -hmm but I do see sentences almost foundational to all of those things. And, and in a sense, that's partly why I think, you know, the relations between two rocks on a distant planet that will never be observed, that relation means nothing to me because it has no impact on any sentient being. Whereas the relations that have impact on sentient beings, they matter because of the impact. So I think that is a difference between them, between us. But again, there's a, still some commonality there. Well, but, but um, just, just very brief, uh, just a bracket here to say that to, I don't think there is value in our glass of water and an old book relationship i would not talk in those terms to me there needs to be this is a tricky move because i don't want to say there is only one thing here but there needs to be some sense of awareness or something in which inanimate objects there is no value there or anything i would agree with you on that one altogether yeah, yeah. it's not like a technical physical relation it is a if not a social relation at least some sort of relation that involves i guess a sentient being or something with a perspective or a, yeah yeah Makes sense. Makes sense. It's not all yeah, relations. Yeah. Something, something and, yeah. and we've so so the final question really is the future developing and how can we make the future better? And you've touched on that with both, you know, in your thesis and talking about zoopolis and zoo democracy, which I guess is a, a, 
a sort of central theme in how you'd like to see the future developing. And I, and I think you're right. It's a fundamental mm. shift in mindset, right? And it's, it's similar to the mindset that I guess humans have tried to take with humanity, right? You start with family and larger groups and maybe my nation and maybe my race or my gender. And, you know, then a light goes on and you go, oh, we're all humans, right? And there's the Universal <laughs> Declaration of Human Rights, at least in theory. And, you know, many people still have a lot of work to do on that front, but at least in concept, mm -hmm. people have gone, oh yeah, all humans, wow, my mind is blown, right? I now have a very different way of thinking about ethical value. And of course, you, you and I and many other people have gone the next stage or trying to go the next stage beyond that and recognizing that humans aren't the only morally salient entities. There are suffering and perspectives and, you know, there are others aren't just human others. There are non-human others out there as well and they have value and i've done mm. you know some sort of silly th thought experiments of s taking some of the artifacts and language we've developed as humans to broaden our moral scope and just applied them to all sentience so you can look at the universal mm. declaration of human rights and rewrite it as a universal declaration of sentient rights you can take the sustainable development goals and rewrite them as sentientist development goals you can take language like humanity and say look should we be talking about sentientity you can talk about you know, homicide and talk about, shouldn't there be a crime of senticide? There are all sorts of things you can do with language and with mindsets that can open the doors to at least considering all sentient beings. And that sense of zoo democracy is central to you. But how do you, would you paint that, maybe that utopian vision first of where we think we should be going towards? Mm -hmm. But you can also touch on some more pragmatic stuff as well. Mm. Sure. Yes, I'm very sympathetic to this idea of thought experiments, but just, I do think we need to just explore be imaginative. I'm really interested in people who are trying to imagine a different future. If people are listening, I'm very interested in this. If people are working on that, like people like you as well, Jamie, of course, I love what you are doing in that sense to just, let's just think how things could look like, you know, in the sustainable development goals or whatever things might be. So yeah, that's wonderful. I think what you are doing. And then what I wanted to say about a better future, perhaps the most I wouldn't talk of a utopia at all, because yeah. even with Zoopolis by Sutton Olson and Will Kimblicka, because I think what they are doing, and at least that's how I read it and how I would like to work on these kind of things, is really grounded on what is feasible. And so in a way, I think we need to do perhaps two kind of exercises or ways of thinking about this. One is, if you like the most, and I don't want to say utopic, but unrealistic, something that might be very difficult to happen within our current liberal democratic capitalist, capitalist kind of states and ways of operating. So one could say, let's think about a future beyond that completely and just see what happens. That's not what Sudanese and Wilkin are doing. I think yeah. what they are doing is to say, okay, within a liberal democratic capitalist system and a global order as we have it, organized with the states, with the UN, nation power, nation states power and all that, how can we op change this in a massive way that is going to be much better for animals and it can coexist with those systems? How do we do that? And what can we imagine within that framework? I, so the point is what I'm about to say in, in a second might sound to people, this is so unrealistic, but it is when one looks at it carefully, it is very realistic because it is grounded on our current political and institutions and systems. Yeah. So for instance, they adopt. So what were they say in that book? And I think I'm not fully in agreement with some of those things, but I think they open up uh, a lot of questions here. Is they say we should think of domesticated animals as citizens. So all dogs and cats and so on in London and a lot of other domesticated animals, but also the ones in factory farms, they should be citizens, have even rights to vote. We need to think how do they vote? And this idea of they have voices, we need to listen to those voices, and they need to, those voices need to shape our political and legal systems. So those would be citizens. We would talk of, if you like, zoo citizens, mm. uh, and we would all be zoo citizens, human and non-human animals. And some some people. So the will, very notion of the people would change that. And yep. some people some people will say that approach is ridiculous. But mm -hmm. but as ever, I think you're right that there is there there are roots mm -hmm. of um, a realistic approach there already. So when you think about how we think about young human yeah. children or we even think about future generations now, you're seeing more and more mechanisms being built into democratic structures to represent the voices and the rights of the interests of humans who are not able to represent their own interests, young children, future, future exactly. generations, these things are being set up. And it's just an extension of that way of thinking to morally salient patients 
in the world that we should have compassion for, we should care for, that don't maybe don't have the capabilities to fully communicate in a way we're used to, but it doesn't mean they don't warrant representation. Indeed, and I love that you mentioned this because precisely they draw a lot on literature coming from critical disability studies, kind of children literature. And so Donaldson recently in 2020, she published an article that is really interesting and deep and fantastic called Animal Agoras. And one of the things that she looks at there is this notion of microboards. So microboards that are used elsewhere, but she focuses on the case in, in Canada because they are based in Canada, Sudanason and Will Kimika. But Sudanason, who is the author of this article, she looks at uh, microboards are these sort of, let's say organizations, they are not organizations, but I will call it like that, that try to represent the interests of people with severe cognitive disabilities. And so it is close um, uh, relatives and so on. And so she tries to think, okay, how could we use this mechanism, which we already have, it does exist now, with animals. So how could say uh, people who coexist with those animals, we say some dogs or whatever, or cats, or uh, say horses or other beings, how can we then take into account their voices with this kind of system that we are already using in this with these microports that they, that they are called? So, and, and she explores that in that article. And there are a lot of other things we, that we can explore and think. Uh, and animals, once we try to do those things, animals will tell us a lot of things. There will be a process of feedback in which they will be telling, say, and we see this with our companion animals at home. So if, you, if I don't know if you share your life with a dog or not, but yeah. it's usually dogs that the examples we give, but we will have a lot of cases with pigs and a lot of other animals once they go out from the factory farms. If they come into our cities, then things would change a lot. But the idea with dogs is, so a dog might be scratching the door saying, I want to go out. And there are dogs that don't do that. Like I, I share my, here in my household with a dog friend of mine, uh, and he is a dog, he really likes to be at home. So let's assume that there's a dog that really likes to be at home. So there will be cases that they will be, I just feel happy here, I'm happy to go out for a while, but I'm really homing, I like homing in the sense of a human built environment in this case. Other dogs will tell you, I don't want this, I want to roam around freely as much as I like, and sometimes I might come to hang out with you, like all of humans might do, and then we just have to respect that and then try to, and this is very important as well, this field of animal urbanism. So it's a field that is trying to see, and the idea of zoopolis came from Jennifer Walk at UC Berkeley, uh, and she has done a lot of work on urbanism, she comes from that kind of ba background of urbanism. How do we transform the architecture, the facilities, uh, of our cities to accommodate uh, non-human animals uh, in our cities. And here again, the work of people in disability studies is super important. They thought a lot about some of these questions, of course. So that would be a sort of this zoopolis idea. Then there are the, uh, very quickly, the notion of liminal animals, who are animals like squirrels or say uh, rats and mice and so on, who Donaldson and Kimika say, well, we don't really have there is no sense of multi-species community there. We don't really relate to each other. We lead semi-independent lives and we should respect those beings. We should be very, well, for example, with roadkills, we should make sure there are no roadkills because they are sentient beings and other things. But in terms of say, having a right to vote, having a right to shape certain aspects of our political and legal systems, this should be different. And then it's the idea of wild animals who they think are sovereign communities. They lead the independent lives completely. They have their own modes of social organization. They have their own modes of existence, their own cultures. Carl Safina has written on animal cultures, for example, as well. And they say, we should just play with any other community, recognize that they are self-determining beings who have a right to just lead their lives in their own terms. Mm. And we should just respect that and withdraw from nature in many cases, because we are all the time invading those territories and destroying them. So what we should do is to protect those territories. So those beings, at least from human harm, so that those things can develop as the kind of individuals and communities they are. On the more strategic side, I do think, and this is a very personal thought, that, um, that we really, I would invite many animal organizations to do this, to focus much more on wild animals, because I understand that uh, animal agriculture is horrible and we need to end that as soon as possible. But if one thinks about it, Wild animals, in many cases, if they were granted fundamental legal rights, very little would change in the lives of uh, people in their daily lives. So in some parts of the UK, Australia, uh, US, and so on, because there are already preserves, parks, that humans don't really go there, they don't do anything there. So you said, these animals here have fundamental legal rights to say, in this case, which is something I have worked on at Cambridge, 
a right to self-determination, a fundamental legal right to develop autonomously as the beings since they are. If that was implemented, if that was passed in a parliament or whatever thing, that change would not mean almost anything for human beings in their daily lives. They wouldn't have to change anything at all. Well, anything at all. We might need to change some things in terms of you know, some, uh, I don't know, some petrol company or fuel company. They might need to stop their activities or there might be some pollution things that we mm. might need to be careful with. But in terms of what you and I do here in London, and most people would do in London, that wouldn't change much. So from a strategic point of view, it's a, it's a brilliant target, in my opinion, because if we target domesticated animals in factory farms, like that kind of thing, it's a massive change in terms of the economy, in terms of what people eat, cultural, it's a massive shift, culturally speaking. It's urgent that we do that because of climate change and what the animals are experiencing, of course, I would completely agree with this. But from a strategic point of view, if we think who are the animals who could get fundamental legal rights in the easiest way possible that would not change so many, because we need some of animals to just have fundamental legal rights. We've not got that at all. Yeah. We've never broken that line. So I think the wild animals case is a very good case to get that done. There's at least two very different ways of thinking about wild animals. And one which I think is yours and Donaldson and Kimlicker's is one recognizing there's a different nature of relations there, right? They're in a sense, have, a, have their own networks of relations that aren't interdependent with us in the same way as liminal animals or farmed animals mm -hmm. or companion animals. So there's a relationally different view. I think there's also a sense of seeing maybe nature or the wild as being another source of intrinsic value in its own right, independent. You might have added it to your list of culture and relations and other things earlier on as well as sentience, right? So many people feel that there's a view that there's an intrinsic value in nature and the wild. Mm. My, my fear is that even what you've suggested, which is granting rights of autonomy and self-determination, actually misses the biggest problem in the wild, which is wild animal suffering, which is seems to be catastrophic and awful and arguably even animal farming in the shade in terms of its sheer scale. So I'm nervous that we go, we have a reverence for the wild. We know humans have had a very negative impact on the wild. We have a different nature of relation, mm -hmm. which means we should separate from them. We will assume that what wild animals really want is autonomy and self-determination. Therefore, mm -hmm. the suffering that goes on the wild is of no, no interest to us. We remove our moral consideration from wild animals. And mm -hmm. a different perspective would be to say each of those individual wild animals probably like us. Yes, they want self-determination and autonomy. But what they really want is freedom from suffering, freedom not to be eaten by a predator, freedom not to starve. So if, if we take a more individualistic approach, looking at the individual sentient beings within the wild, mm -hmm. they would have a very different perspective. It's much more focused on the visceral you know, suffering and the experiences of their own lives in their own terms. And I'm nervous that the Donaldson Kimlicker approach, reverence for the wild and this relational separation, just abandons them to awful suffering. Now, at the same time, I'm not saying that there's an easy answer for us addressing wild animal mm. suffering. I've had a fascinating conversation uh, with Carl Johansson, who's just written a book on the topic. And there are some really pragmatic, low-risk things we can do. We're not just talking about bioengineering predators and yeah. you know, the sort of craziest stuff as well. But, and I don't have a strong view about the best approach, but I just don't want to remove moral consideration from the trillions, maybe a quadrillion of individual sentient beings in the wild. And I'm nervous that a sort of zooplus approach might do that. I'm more tempted by a sort of more expansive cosmopolitan approach, sort of Cochrane's approach, or one again that goes back to seeing each individual sentient being as of warranting moral consideration in their own right. And that may open up a whole new world of very challenging problems, but let's not remove our moral consideration. But I'm much closer to the kind of work that comes from people like Ava Meyer and Sudan Osman with Kimlika. But also I wanted to mention here the work of Dinesh Wadiwell in the war against animals, because this is very crucial. As I said, the subtitle of my thesis is contesting human sovereignty over animals. Yeah, yeah. So one crucial notion, I take the notion of human sovereignty over animals. Dinesh Wadiwell works a lot on that in that book. Extensively, he discusses that topic, which of course one can think of it as a form of human domination um, of animals as it, it comes from Christianity, if you like, uh, and so on and so forth, always this yeah. idea. The idea of husbandry as well is very tight with this, intertwined with this notion. 
So something that um, Venus Wadi well says in that book, that I think is very important and has influenced me massively, is that we should, as it were, stop before your question, he would already stop us and say, in order to ask the kind of question you're asking, Jamie, he would say, probably, I will speak for myself, but I think he would say this. He would say something along the lines of, we need to be able to justify our right to decide over other lives. We need to be able to say, why is it that we humans, we are one species among many others, who, by the way, in the evolutionary scale, we've come really late, we are late comers. Who are we to determine what all earthlings do in their lives? Who are we to determine who lives and who dies? Who are we to determine how wildlife is organized? Who are we to determine that we can create animals, that we can move animals, that we can decide what an ecosystem should look like because yeah. we humans decide what an ecosystem should be. We are the ones who do that. And here epistemology is very important. The notion of epistemic sovereignty. Who are we to, for example, name, which I was talking about this in the past, but it's very related to what you are asking, to name certain species as invasive, natives, yeah. um, a threat. Some activities of some invasive species are regarded as a threat. And there are empirical studies that show when a species is labeled as invasive, automatically, because this happens psychologically to us, we feel it's much easier to kill them. To kill an invasive species, uh, to kill animals who are a threat, yeah. it's fine, as it were. So, yeah. and we come, here, we, all these we, we come up with these happen. categories to suit ourselves. Yeah. Yes, but my thing is, all this stuff that I'm discussing assumes a position of human dominion over animals at the yeah. level of producing knowledge and at the level of actual policies, practices in which we say nature should be like this. And we go and decide it. And we decide you cannot kill the thing because the thing is going to suffer and then whatever thing. And we are making all those decisions. So the question is, who are we to make those decisions? Yeah. And the point is, unless, and I've never heard an argument, a good argument for this, unless someone can argue that holding that position of dominion is right and that we should have that position of dominion and why we should have it, unless I see an argument that is properly substantiated and I've never seen it, I agree with you, we should not just neglect all the animal suffering there is. I agree with that. And we, the idea of moral remainders, I was saying before, the idea of not cutting, for example, trees, so that, and Donna and Kimlika, I believe, would agree with this. We can, and they are the first who says, we need to withdraw from nature a lot in the sense that we need to uh, let animals reclaim their own territories because we've just invaded those spaces and we've just destroyed so many of their inhabit yeah. uh, habitats and it's their homes. So we just need now to withdraw a lot of our forms of agriculture, uh, energy production systems should change. They are the first to advocate for that kind of, even when it comes to animal suffering, and I'm going to say here something more related to, if you like, the more pragmatic side of it. So we don't know the consequences of our actions in many cases. So yeah. we might say, oh, we should save this thing or the other or whatever. And then we create a, here a chain effect that we don't know the consequences and then it ends up yeah. being a mess. Yeah. So even from a kind of consequentialist point of view, we should be very careful with this. But if, for example, I do believe in this, the kind of Claire Palma approach, very briefly, we, I do think that we have certain duties that come from, if you like, actual interactions. I know this is a very complex thing to argue, but if, and we see this with our families, with our friends and so on, right? Like we might do things for certain things that we might not do for others, simply because we are enmeshed in those relationships, we love each other and so on. That doesn't mean we should then not care at all about what happens to people in other countries and other animals in everywhere because they are sentient, they have interests. We should take all that into account. But we should also take into account that if I encounter, say, an animal in the wild who is harmed, I believe it would be pretty legitimate, a good thing to do to just respond to that being and try to help as it were. Yeah. But that's not the same as saying, let's manage nature worldwide and they start here to be the you know gods of earth who decide yeah. everything. It just looks dystopic to me. It, it's uh, Intuitively, it feels wrong, but there's also this of human sovereignty that to me is problematic. But you yeah. had yeah. A, an argument to make in that sense. <laughs> well, and, and you've mentioned the argument already, I think, but I'll, let me come to it in a moment. So firstly, I totally agree about this sort of epistemic humility, right? The, the networks, the independence, mm. the second, third, nth order consequences. These are complex systems, so we should act with real prudence and humility because we just don't know. So I think I completely agree with you. That's not a reason for withdrawing our moral consideration. It's just a reason we should have deep humility about any intervention we make. I completely agree. I also agree that when you look at the track record of humanity, right, 
in many respects, it's pretty awful, right, when it comes to non-humans, right, farming, what we've done with the wild, deforestation, extractive. So as a corrective to that, it feels right to me to say we should have humility, right? We've been, we've had hubris, we've had arrogance, we've had disregard, we've extracted, we've been selfish. So we should withdraw, we should have humility. We are just another species trying to share this planet. Why do we think we're exceptional, special? There's a sort of human supremacy that drives so much of our thinking. And I have a great deal of sympathy with that. We should just back away. I guess what I'm nervous about is if that humility leads us to completely disregard the suffering of other sentient beings, maybe the humility's gone too mm. far. Because I think the, the argument isn't that humans should have dominion. I don't think, I think you're right. There isn't an argument. But the argument in favour of intervention is basically a moral patient, a sentient being saying, please help me. In the same way as if you find a wild mm -hmm. animal injured on the side of the road, you, you would want to help. I think we can imagine that appeal coming from suffering wild mm -hmm. animals in general. And I fear that if we, yeah. someone drowning in a pond and we stand on the side mm -hmm. and say, who am, I to yes. who am I to decide who lives or dies? When you think about, in their own terms, the perspective of the victim, they don't give a shit, right? They just want you to help. So that's the balancing in. I share your need for this sort of humility and for this, we have to break down this human arrogance, but let's not break it down so far that we forget that we have enormous potential to, to do good and to help in a sensible way. But so again, I don't know if there's a balancing point there somewhere. I'm so like in everything you've said, like every word resonates with me a lot. Uh, so I think we are very close here. One thing I, I wanted to just make a kind of self-correction or something is that I am not against intervention. Uh, in nature, especially when the harms are human induced uh, yeah. kind of harms. Yeah. I believe that we have a duty to intervene and do something, but that doesn't mean that our duty to intervene then, which is what conservationists tend to do, they just eradicate a lot of animals. They just say, oh, I know the case of horses because I have written on this. I know the case of horses in Australia, right? So they say, oh, horses put in endangered species in more dangerous in where they, they can harm them through trampling and a lot of other things. Because uh, the, these native species are in danger, uh, we are just going to kill all the horses. Yeah. That's not, I, I completely disagree with that, but I do think we need to intervene. So I wouldn't take a sort of transitioning approach that would be like, let them be. And yeah. then we have introduced horses into Australia, messed up all the ecosystems, and now we say, we have nothing to say about it. No, yeah. we need to then offer solutions and a concrete solution, for example, could be, we can try to fence a spaces that are very sensitive to horses trampling. So say that you create a kind of, circle in a certain bubble of a space that is and the horses can still roam freely everywhere go to wherever they want but in those spaces they will not be able to access because they are very sensitive to trampling for instance and then humans have to intervene we are it's a human intervention here we are building fences to protect certain species who are very vulnerable to the trampling of the horses and we humans have introduced the horses so we are the ones who should respond to that kind of conflict yeah. and problem right now uh, you also mentioned uh, we should intervene in some cases. We need to have that thought with us and not consider it very seriously. However, when I think of the alternative, to me, because of the scale and so on, the idea that we humans are going to go around helping all those beings, it, it begins to look like we are God or something like that. Because just think about going to nature to just all animals who, like lots of animals, for example, are born and they die and then a lot of um, uh, animals will eat those corpses and there is a, the ecosystems operate like that yeah. and lots of animals survive for that reason. And it's their form of existence, as it were. And they know it's, they're suffering them. They want to, I do not want to dismiss that. But the alternative to that seems to me to reproduce clearly this notion of human sovereignty, this notion of we humans decide what happens on earth and in what terms. And I under, it's a very legitimate and important thought. There is a lot of suffering going on there and we cannot dismiss it. But this is one of those moments that I feel like, and as you said as well, from a, but I, this is a more kind of, so there is that, that tension to me, but there is also a contributing factor to what I'm discussing that, as you said, our track record is terrible. Like we just think yeah. often that we humans are wonderful and we have this ability of making the right decisions always because we are rational, great people around, but we are not. Like we are destroying, we are might lead ourselves into extinction soon. And we are 
like half, um, you know, lots of species are extinct now because of us. We have polluted earth in a crazy way, et cetera, et cetera. So when one takes all these things into consideration, all of them, when I have thought about this question, I've just been led to say, look, we just, we should not intervene in this massive way, which does not mean we should not intervene in cases like the one I was explaining with the horses. We have a duty there. We introduce the horses, we do intervene. But then with the idea of epistemic humility, our track record, the idea of human sovereignty, and of course, and I ponder this, I don't dismiss it at all. There is a lot of suffering and that's why I don't simply say that's what we should do. It yeah. does make me sometimes hesitate and feel uncomfortable. But that's where I am led by all these other considerations as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. You've, I think we both the have same, plenty of moral remainders and will do forever, but real food for thought. And it's been fascinating how I think, again, I'm not an acad- academic at all, but we come from different sets of influences really heartening to find how much common ground there is between our different perspectives mm-hmm. and yeah and i love you know the way you've talked about taking an approach that is it's pluralistic but it is still grounded in reality because as you said the value flows from reality mm-hmm. and yeah i wholeheartedly agree yeah so it's been fascinating mm-hmm. thank you what's the best way of people following you finding more about your work social media or other things i'll include a link to the show notes of course yes people can just on twitter uh, is at Pablo, so it's Pablo and then P and Castello, my uh, my surname. So that's on Twitter. You can people can find me there. And also, if they, you write my name on Google, you will see my university profile and so on. There is my email there, so people can contact me on email. But before we finish, I just wanted to say that I loved chatting with you, uh, Jamie. It was super nice, and I really enjoyed it. And as you said, we come from different backgrounds and influences, but there is so much common ground. I I really like it. So yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it was a genuine pleasure. Thank you, Pablo. Well, take care and I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day.